So welcome everyone to Shivali's Books Online. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday evening. I'm so excited to see that so many people are joining us. Uh, if you don't know Shivali's Books, we are the oldest independent bookstore in Los Angeles. We were established in 1940 and you can find us in Larchmont Village in Hancock Park. And I have a confession before we get started, which is that although I live in LA, I cannot say I am much of a film buff or a TV buff, but I have been told by many a film buff this week that I should be extremely excited to host the two gentlemen that we've got here tonight. Uh, we have Ken Quapis for his new book, But What I Really Want to Do is Direct, and his conversational partner, Jim Hemphill. So Jim is uh, an award-winning screenwriter and director whose works have been screened at Sundance, American Cinematic, and many more international art houses and festivals. He is a visual historian at the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. And his latest book is The Arts and Craft of TV Directing. Tonight, though, Jim has the very difficult task of interrogating our main star, Ken Quapis. Ken is also an award-winning movie and TV director. He's directed 11 feature films, which you might have heard of, A Walk in the Woods, He's Just Not That Into You, and Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, just to name a few. But perhaps uh, the most important title he has, uh, according to a tweet that I saw today, is that Ken is, quote unquote, the nicest person in showbiz. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over the stage to these two very accomplished gentlemen and we will see where they take us tonight. Please give a very warm digital welcome to Ken Quapis and Jim Hensel. Gentlemen, if you would please take it away. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So Ken, uh, you know, I, I was telling you before, I, as you know, voraciously consume every book I can find on filmmaking, directing, and I'm always looking for, I'm always looking for that one book that I can kind of keep by my side and refer to that has all the answers in it. And I've, I've never found it until this book, till your book. Uh, it really is incredible. I mean, because it's not just, you know, you talk about how, directing actors and blocking and where to put the camera, but it's also about how to take a meeting and the business. And it's about the, mental self-care. And I guess I'm just curious what your starting point was for it. What made you want to write the book? And and what did you feel was kind of, uh, I don't know if the word is lacking, but what did, what did you feel you had to bring to it that other books on directing hadn't delivered before? Well, you know, I've been directing for 37 years. And during the past, I don't know, five to 10 years, I've had the um, pleasure of mentoring a lot of young directors. And a lot of the conversations I've had are, of course, about craft, you know, how to talk to actors, where to put the camera, et cetera. But more and more, I, I felt like the kinds of questions I was being asked by up and coming directors uh, were things that I did not know anything about when I was in film school. And they were basically fall under the category of how to comport yourself as a director, how to, how to, for instance, and there's so many examples, how to assert authority on a set without ever having to be authoritarian, for instance, or how to, uh, how to weather all manner of setbacks as you're trying to get a project made, or how to give actually, how to give productive feedback to someone. <laughs> that's a whole, there's a whole book to write just about that. <laughs> and, and that's what inspired me to start. It was like all of those kinds of things, in, and, and also just wanting to kind of get my story down and tell, you know, tell the story of where I've been. But it was really inspired by those kinds of, not quite craft, but more like, you know, kind of interpersonal skills that a director needs to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the hardest things about directing is finding that it's such a sweet spot between where you, you have to be, you have to take control without being controlling. And like you say, you have to be the authority figure without being authoritarian. And, and all of that, I just think the book addresses so beautifully. And another thing that I think, uh, you know, I found interesting in the book, because I had the same experience, was you talk about going to two different film schools for two different degrees and never taking a class in acting and never taking a class in, and it was the exact same thing for me. And one of the things I love about the book is the way you talk about your, you know, your relationships with actors and especially the, the section on he's just not that into you, I found really interesting. 
because that's a movie that has so many different types of actors in it. You know, I mean, you've got from different, from very different backgrounds and it, you know, led me to, I wanted to ask you, to me, another thing that's hard about directing is you can have five actors in a scene and they all come from five different backgrounds, five different kinds of training or no training. And sometimes you can have somebody who's great on the first take and then they kind of go down and then somebody else who needs to rev up and takes a lot of takes before they're at their best and somebody who's in the middle. And how do you deal with a situation like that? How do you create an environment that kind of can reconcile all those things and get everybody's best work out of them? Well, there's a, I mean, there's a couple of different situations that you mentioned. One is just people with people who are, you know, people who may be great right out of the gate, but have wildly different styles. And one of the, one of the films I talk about in this regard is he's just not that India where there's a lot of important scenes between Jennifer Goodwin and Justin Long. They're kind of like chief, you know, first among equals in this ensemble. And, uh, and they had such wildly different acting styles. Jennifer, you know, is classically trained uh, and, and sort of really attacks the, the text almost like it was, you know, a play. And Justin is like a you know, wildly inventive improviser. So like when we started our scenes, they, it, it, they, at, at the beginning, <laughs> they, went, they were bad. They went off the rails pretty quickly because uh, you know, Jenny would say her scripted line and Justin would come back with a, uh, an improvised line and then Jenny didn't know quite what to do. So she'd go back to her next scripted line and pretty soon the scene actually made no sense. So <laughs> I had to kind of you know, flag on the play and, and, and sort of talk to them about how they needed to think, create a bridge between their different styles. And the only thing that I will add to that is I'm sure there are many directors who are watching. I had, I had minimal rehearsal time before shooting with them. And that's just a typical problem. Actors are unavailable or you, don't, you just don't have the money for the rehearsal time. And so this is a kind of a problem that I could have sorted out had we had rehearsal time. Uh, and by the way, uh, the, the same thing applies to actors who kind of get up to speed at different times too. I mean, there's, there's, I think that's just a case where the first couple of scenes, you just have, have to be very observant about who, you know, is, is prepared and ready and gives you a great first take and who is not awake yet. And maybe around take seven, they're properly caffeinated and they give you a great take. So, I mean, I, I, I think these are, you know, just, it's part of the, I'll call it the orchestration aspect of directing, just mm -hmm. sort of knowing, you know, when to bring out certain instruments. Well, and because these days you so rarely get rehearsal and so you are st sort of figuring those things out the first couple days on set, you know, in your ideal world, and I know this isn't always the case that you even have the ideal situation, but how do you like to schedule your movies? Do you like to start with something, do you start with something very light to sort of ease into, you, into it? Or do you like to start with something really big and just hit the ground running or somewhere in between? Well, I've never, I've never in nearly four decades had the pleasure of directing anything, whether a show or a film in, in continuity. So you're always sort of struggling to figure out. I mean, the last thing you want to do is, is, is be doing the, the climax of your picture or the climax of a, a, an episode, like on, on the first morning. I will say though that on any given shoot day, what I try to do is, is schedule a, the meteor scene earlier in the day. Just because I, I, and this is nothing about the actors. This is actually more about me. I kind of feel like I, I need, I, I, otherwise I might kind of procrastinate, uh, you know, and, and sort of spend too much time on something that's actually not so critical because I'm nervous about getting to the meteor scene. So I actually sort of, as a, as a way of forcing myself into the, to jump into the deep end of the pool, you know, earlier rather than later, I, I, I put the tougher scene first. So. Mm -hmm. So I know, you know, like a lot of us, you have to kind of, you had to learn how to talk to actors and, and how to direct actors kind of on the job. But did you, after film school at any point, study acting yourself or have you ever acted in anything? No, and I should never be in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I, I, as you said, I, I, I went to two very fine uh, universities with very fine film departments and was never required to take an acting class. And so I was fortunate to get a directing job pretty soon after leaving school and had the shuddering realization that I really didn't know the first thing about how to talk to actors and, and realized I just had to figure this out on my feet. And so I, I can tell you with 
you know, I'm <laughs> quite honestly that over the first over many years, I gave actors some of the most confounding notes they've ever heard. I've confused more good actors over <laughs> my time. But I but I but I decided that was just an I mean, I, I feel like you know, every director has certain things that come a little more naturally to them. And in my case, I think as, as, a, as a beginning director, I felt very, uh, pre-visualizing things came very easily to me. And I realized that I had to kind of not worry about that so much and kind of focus on this area that was a bit of a blank for a while. So I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I feel like that became a, a project for me over, over time is just being able to learn about acting, but I've never taken an acting class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to give you an idea of what a bad actor I am, I was actually uh, digitally removed from an episode of The Fosters because I was so unconvincing playing a guy walking down the street. So uh, I have a lot of... <laughs> I don't know, I think those are important bragging rights that you were digitally removed. Yeah. Here. It cost the company some visual yeah. effects money. <laughs> it did. Yeah, I was so I was so ill at ease on camera. They threw me, I was I was on the set, they threw me in a scene. And I again I was so unconvincing playing a guy playing myself walking down a street that they and it was in the final shot of the final episode of the season. So it was this big crane shot and it was and it was very expensive, I'm sure, for them to remove me for it's probably, you know, it was uh but it gave me a lot of respect for actors. I mean, cause I couldn't even do that. So uh, I'm amazed by, by what they do. But um, you know, another thing I wanted to ask you about in this book that I, cause I, I really love, I mean, again, there's, there's all these kind of layers. It's like, it's, it's sort of an autobiography. It's a book about the craft. It's also kind of your love letter to the movies you love. And, and, you know, there's so many great, uh, like it's the kind of book that you read it and you want to go and watch all of these movies if you haven't watched them or revisit them. You know, it made me immediately want to go watch Magnificent Ambersons again and Lawrence of Arabia again and uh, some of these other movies that you reference. And I'm curious, um, you know, how you chose, because I know you're a big cinephile and you've seen a gazillion movies. So how did you decide, what, was, what were the sort of factors that went into deciding which movies you were going to delve into in depth? Well, I, I wanted to focus on films that had an impact on me when I was younger when I was a younger viewer when I was coming of age not I, I, I and and I also wanted to focus on I mean some of the films are very familiar like 2001 but what I uh, or Lawrence of Arabia but what I wanted to focus on was actually something small I didn't want to like talk about how much I love a particular film I wanted to select one shot from each of those films and not the most obvious shot um so for instance, the, the, in 2001, there were so many amazing images in that film that are so iconic, but the, the sh what I wanted to focus on is the, just the close-up of Hal's eye, which occurs about halfway through the picture. And it's the moment where Hal, the computer, realizes that his crew members, his crewmates, are about to betray him. And uh, it, again, there's nothing flamboyant about it. There's no cool move. There's, it, but the, the entire film, and it took a while for me to kind of figure this out. The whole film turns on this one very simple shot. So that's kind of, there's, if there's a hidden agenda, I think I'm, what I'm always eager to impart to young directors is it's not the flashy shot that people are, that's gonna really get you, you know, in, in a deep way. It's sometimes it's, it's the very simplest image but at the right moment, and it'll just stick with you, or or you won't realize. This is even better. You don't realize how much a particular moment has got you in its grip until weeks, months, years later. That was that's what was exciting to me. Yeah. Well, I love the whole section on two thousand one for a number of reasons. One of which is I think it speaks to a larger quality of the book that I love, which is that your the book kind of is a uh, it's sort of a manifesto for thinking for yourself. And there's a lot that's sort of a running theme that kind of comes in and out is like don't let the critics do your thinking for you don't let other people you know it's it, whether it's your own movies or other people's movies and so I love that with your 2001 discussion you kind of uh fight this conventional wisdom that Kubrick is you know they always people say he's a cold director and like I always hate when people say Kubrick it's, it's sort of one of those things where you know when someone says Kubrick is a cold director I feel sorry for that person because I know they're an idiot because it's sort of like they're just listening to what this this conventional wisdom that's been parroted for years. But in fact, he's a very emotional director. And that shot you're talking about is a perfect example. He invests so much emotion in this inanimate machine 
you know, and it, it's, it's really uh, amazing. But the other thing I like about that section on Kubrick is your sort of discussion of your changing relationship with that movie, you know, which is really, really interesting. The way you kind of uh, came full circle and started out loving it and then, you know. Oh, I'm sure that like a lot of filmmakers and a lot of, a lot of film lovers, I mean, one of the things that's so appealing about it, someone like Stanley Kubrick is the, 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 the control, the formality. And, and it, you know, as a young person, nothing made me happier than to see umpteen number of shots, you know, framed in, in, in a crazily perfect, you know, symmetrical way. And I think, you know, as I got a little older, that sort of symmetry and that sort of, um, what's, what's the right way to put it? I guess anal, retent anal retentive attention to detail, does that sound right? <laughs> Started to bore me. And then further, you know, more years passed. And when I kind of re-approached the film again, what I discovered was just what you said, that there was actually a lot of emotional content that I didn't connect to as a younger person, particularly this character, who uh, this character, Hal, who uh, is probably maybe the most human character in the movie and is the one who has the saddest, to me, the saddest outcome. He's, he's put down, mm -hmm. he's, his brain is dismantled. And I, I can only say from personal experience, I've, I have more than a few people in my life who are challenged, you know, cognitively challenged at the moment. And I, when I watched the film not too long ago, I was like in tears watching a scene about a computer being turned off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because I had the exact same experience you had with a different Kubrick movie, The Shining, where it was my favorite movie as a kid. I thought it was the greatest movie ever. Then, you know, got to film school, got a little, went through a phase where I didn't like it and then kind of came back around. And now it's back to being one of my all-time favorite movies, which is, you know, it's just why I've always had this kind of problem taking uh, Pauline Kael seriously, because she always bragged that she never watched a movie more than once. And I just always think like, how can you be so confident in your own opinion of a movie when, you know, movie, I don't know, it's just, it just always seems strange. But, but that leads me to another thing I wanted to ask you about, which I love all the stuff in your book about your relationship with critics and with film criticism in general. And again, your relationship with it as a young movie fan and film student, and then how that changed as a filmmaker and all that. And, and, and I found, um, you know, I found your whole discussion, the, the film criticism thing leads to just your, your discussion in general about where you find the pleasure in your work and how you sort of avoid, this gets back to that mental health thing I was talking about, mm -hmm. um, how you kind of keep yourself centered uh, as a working filmmaker when you've got people saying horribly nasty things sometimes about your stuff. Well, I think, well, again, just to sort of, give you the, that journey in short form. Uh, about 30 years ago, I directed a feature that came out and was really trashed by critics, like in a, a way that was like so surprising to me. And um, I, it, it really was, it was very demoralizing. And, and, uh, and, but it inspired me to begin a research project. And that was to start to interview, and not formally, but just to ask creative people that I'd known or that I was meeting how they dealt with reviews and critics and how they how they weathered you know a blistering review and and what i realized pretty quickly is that creative people have an amazing ability well maybe all people do but definitely creative people have an amazing ability to to commit to memory their worst notices <laughs> i i i remember talking to a couple of film directors one of whom I really, I, I mentioned a film that she had done. I was so admiring of this film and she proceeded to quote back word for word, this like terrible review. And I remember even then thinking, oh my God, that stuck on her hard drive. And that's what sort of took, got me to the next step to think, well, why do I need any of this in my head at all? I mean, you know, there, there's, uh, and so to go to your question, where, where does the satisfaction come from? Well. What's great is, I mean, I, I, I decided to, you know, it, it wasn't easy, but I started not reading reviews of my own work. And I started re not reading reviews of other people's work, particularly people I knew personally. I just, and I felt kind of freed up on a number of levels, um, not the least of which is I can, yeah, as you said, I don't need, I can, I can make up my own mind what I think of a film. I don't need someone else explaining it to me. But mostly I felt words, you know, I have power and I don't need certain words in my head. 
That's it. Well, the only thing in your book that uh, you describe that's more horrifying than getting bad reviews is the test screening process, which you have some really hilarious descriptions of. I think my favorite was, uh, I wrote it down here somewhere. You had, uh, uh, there was a, I don't know where it went. Uh, oh yeah, an 11 year old told you your movie was totally unreleasable at one of your test screenings. I love that. <laughs> um, oh, no, by the way, just to clarify, the 11 year old didn't stand up and say that. This was this was a written comment on a sheet. You know, everyone fills out a form, but I think you know, the, the, at least for this particular film, and at this screening, the the audience forms you could you put your age in, and I remember it's 11 years old, and and at the end it said, Ed, "Do you have any further comments?" And the you know, two words, totally unreleasable. <laughs> And I thought, who who is this? And then I've I've since come to wonder whether this person is now somebody I work for. <laughs> it's like, yeah, probably running a network or a studio or something. <laughs> but do you? Uh, I guess you know at those test screenings. I mean, how do you kind of? Because I feel like you do a really good job in this book of describing how sometimes the questions themselves are so weirdly slanted in ways that don't make sense. I mean, they'll say, you know, do you like a character? And it's like, well, if it's the villain, you're not supposed to like them. So that's actually a good thing if they don't like you. Right. How do you kind of uh, siphon through all of that and figure out the real, you know, if, if there is a real problem or if there's, or you know, like what, um, how do you make, how do you get something useful out of those? Well, I, again, I, I think it's tricky because there's, a, and I don't write about this, by the way, but I think there is kind of a distinction to be made between productive feedback and, uh, for instance, a focus group. I mean, nothing against civilians who have opinions, but th they, these are not people who are trained storytellers necessarily. So they may say, well, that, you know, that scene in the middle of the picture was dull. The solution is not to lose that scene necessarily. The solution is to look at the first act to see what is missing there that's going to make that second act scene really sing. So again, that's not so. I, I think the, the 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 difficulty with you know research screenings is you get a, a a kind of superficial version of feedback as opposed to somebody who again who, who can come into your cutting room and sit down and say you know what I wonder if you did X or Y in the first act, whether or not the second act wouldn't sag right here. So again, that's the only thing that's, again, it's, it's, it's never an easy, it, it, I don't have a good answer to your question because it's, it, the process is simply painful and uh, you, you kind of cross your fingers that you're gonna squeak by. Mm -hmm. Well, and how do you, when, you know, you also describe in the book, the test screening you had for He's Just Not That Into You, which is a movie that has, you know, scenes, and there's one scene you talk about specifically in the book that, you know, they're very unsettling and they're supposed to be disturbing and uncomfortable and, and all that. And there's, you know, you just, the scene that you describe in the book is actually one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And I'm curious, and you did end up keeping it, even though it was a controversial scene in the test screening. Was that something you had to sort of argue with the producers or the studio or anything like that over? Or how did, how did you get them to keep it? I, I certainly had no argument with the producers because the producers for that film, Nancy Javonin and Drew Barrymore were 100%. We were all of one mind about the kind of film we were making. And, and that is simply a film that didn't play by a typical, you know, didn't use the typical rom-com playbook. Mm -hmm. and, and so what that means scene to scene is that some characters storylines end up happily, some do not. And, and it was just a matter of, um, I, I think that, I mean, again, it's, it's hard to say exactly how we managed to convince the studio that we were going in the right direction, but it was generally the audience was with the film. It's just that the, you know, that the fact that there were unsettling moments, we just had to, again, make the argument that those moments actually were unsettling for the right reasons. And it's, it's, it's just a matter of being able to represent your intentions really precisely at, in a situation like that. Yeah, well, it's funny because the scene you were describing deals with adultery. And I used to, uh, you know, full disclosure, when I first moved out here to LA, one of my first jobs was working for Nielsen NRG, who does all the test screenings and everything. So I got to look, see how the sausage was made. And it was very depressing. But the weird thing was uh, at focus groups and test screenings, invariably, adultery is a subject. If there's a character in a movie who cheated on their spouse or anything like that, I mean, it was just combustible. I mean, people, I think people bring a lot of their own personal experiences into the screening room when they come to those test screenings and uh, it gets really crazy. 
Oh yeah, I mean, I, I to this day I have people who compliment the film but say, "Oh, I'm so angry at Bradley Cooper for cheating on his wife." Well, that's good. <laughs> right. That's great that you're angry at him. <laughs> Why would that's what we wanted? <laughs> so. Um. Uh, something. Oh, something else I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, actually, going back to when we were talking earlier about directing actors, you know, I was curious, what is it like when you're directing someone like Robert Redford, who is a a huge icon who has been directed by some of the best directors in the history of cinema, um, and B is an excellent director himself. I mean, is that was that experience? Is it intimidating? Is it? Uh, is it more fun than directing another real kind of actor? You know, what was it like? Well, I think, I mean, I think working with Redford was, I mean, one of the things right at the outset, you know, he told me, he goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off my director's hat. I'm going to take off my producer's hat. I just want to be the actor and I want to be directed. And, and so that, you know, he's, he set those, you know, he set the stage in that sense. So he, he and I, I felt like, you know, this was a role that, was lighter than certain roles, a lot of roles that he does. And I think he actually was really eager to kind of, you know, to, to get direction from me, especially about how to play something that's a little lighter than we normally think of with Robert Redford. So, I mean, I think that, but I, I do think that whether it's Redford or whether, I mean, I've, I've, you know, had the pleasure to work with a few iconic people like that. And part of it is, it's just, you have to, you're there for a moment you're completely awestruck and then you have to just say okay now you just have to look at this person as this is somebody who's helping me tell a story let's, mm -hmm. let's all get on the same page and tell the same story if you don't it's not you're not going to be able to direct them so mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, when you say Rob, uh, that uh, redford was eager to be directed uh, that brings up something else i remember from your book which is you were talking about uh directing on er and you're saying that sometimes on these shows that have been on for a long time, you're almost told like some of the actors, they don't even want you to talk, you know, they, want, they don't want to be directed. They know what they're doing, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you're mostly known, I think in the TV world, people think of you, they think of these sort of iconic pilots you've directed, like The Office and Larry Sanders and things like that. But when you are on a show like ER or, you know, I don't know, I, don't, I can't remember if you've done other shows that were pre-existing for a long time, how do you kind of um, come in there and A, make it your own and B, kind of overcome the, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, the sort of uh, whatever has settled in there where people maybe aren't, it's harder to excite them and, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, with, with ER, I, I, I directed a couple of episodes, I don't wanna say late in the run, but you know, it was definitely well into the run. So I, and I do think that, you know, at the beginning, some of the actors and some of the crew were very upfront. You know, I, I remember a camera person saying, you know, we've, there's only so many ways you can photograph a, some people pushing a gurney down a hallway and we've done all of them. So don't think you're <laughs> going to come up with a new way to shoot that. And some of the actors were like, yeah, yeah, that, you know, we know our characters. But, but what I figured out pretty quickly is that they say that, but they're dying for some new ideas they just they, they you know they but at the same time what you need to you know you have to acknowledge obviously if a show has been on the air for a, a number of years like that they're doing something right so the first thing you have to do is sort of respect the accomplishment they you know their accomplishment is, is meaningful and then the second thing <laughs> is to figure out how to bring fresh new ideas it's not a trick that you're doing but it's this is sort of the the image i use in the book is it it's like going to a dance you you ask someone to go out on the dance floor with you and the first thing you need to do is like do the steps that they already know and once they're comfortable with you in that sense then you show them a few new steps and so i think it is it is a dance and 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 but what i found and it really, I, this has been confirmed on other shows that I've worked on. Yes, it doesn't matter how, how good they are, or what a well-oiled machine it is. They're always looking for a new way to photograph a gurney being pushed down a hall. <laughs> there's, <laughs> always, there's always new, you know, new, new angles, you know, both emotionally and you know, visually you mm -hmm. know, to, to bring to a show. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that speaks to what I think makes you a great director, that whole, just this idea of finding a new way to push a gurney, which is, I think you really hit that sweet spot where you don't do just the conventional coverage that everybody expects, but you also don't 
get in the way of the story. You know, your camera is always kind of, uh, it's, it's always helping tell the story, but it's not distracting from the story. Like I don't watch your movies and, and get thrown out because you're suddenly whipping around in a way that you shouldn't be or something like that. And I mean, that, like, who are some of the directors that you really revere or have studied who you think kind of get that balance right that you've kind of learned from, you know what I mean? Because it's very, it's a very like classical, like, I feel like you really kind of are sort of following in the classical, like, I mean, you mentioned Lubitsch a lot in your book. And I feel like that's kind of the tradition that I see you working in a lot. Well, I, I mean, actually, you reminded me of something. I, I, and again, this is not in the book. I remember having a conversation with a producer once who was bad-mouthing a director. And this producer said to me, you know, that director simply doesn't know how to move the camera. And I thought, oh, God, what a horrible thing to say about anyone. Because I, and I didn't say it at the time, but I wanted to say, no, just the opposite. This director knows exactly when not to move the camera. And so, I mean, that's one of the things that I, you know, kind of learned on my feet, but one, you know, so to go to the, your question about what kinds of directors really inspire me, I, I mean, I'll just mention one of 50, but I, I love looking at William Wyler's films because I feel like William Wyler knows how to frame in a way that's so cinematic, but you don't realize it's cinematic at all, whether it's working with a DP like Greg Toland or with someone else, there's always a sense that the, the frame is very sculpted, but it's, it could also, I mean, but it could be a two shot, but you just feel a certain kind of dynamic, visual dynamic with it. And he also is somebody who knows when the best thing to do is to just back off and lock down the camera and get out of the way. Um, I, I also, over time, I mean, I, I do this a lot, whether it's in a show or, or, or a, or a film, if, if, if a relationship is important in the storytelling, put the two people in the frame together. The end, I, 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 again, not to rag on anybody else's work, but when I watch a show or a film and I just see you know, one close up bouncing back and forth to another, I get, well, no, put, if you wanna really get a sense of two people and how they relate, it's not, a, it's not about either person, it's about what's happening between them. So put them in the frame together. That was, that, um, that is one of the lessons I learned from Weiler. And, um, and it's one of the things I you know, carry to this day, even working on a comedy, like I worked on this uh, show, Santa Clarita Diet mm -hmm. with Drew Barrymore and Timothy Oliphant. And it's a, it's a zombie comedy, okay? So you would think, well, what's your job as a director? Servicing jokes, I don't know. Well, what I felt was really important was actually to tell the story of a marriage between those two characters, Drew and Timothy. Mm -hmm. And so it, I did, a few episodes, but what, there's one episode in particular where I just decided from the outset, because they were in all scenes, a lot of scenes together, I thought I'm just gonna frame them in, in the same, put them in the same frame throughout. I'm not gonna have one single of them. And I think you, it, you know, again, I, it was sort of an, an, an intellectual idea that I imposed, but I think the result is you felt that relationship more than you would have if it had been single, single Tim, single Drew, single Tim, you know. So that's just, my thinking on that yeah and when you, well, when you take that kind of approach on a tv show do you get any resistance from the powers that be because i know on a lot of shows it's like they want kind of a lot of tv shows they see it as they want all this data for the editing room in a way right. you know and like the direct you know sometimes the directors get in trouble if they're not getting all the close-ups and stuff i mean do you have to fight that or is or or the kind of shows that you're on a little bit more they, uh, but you I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's about the kinds of material or the kind of show. I think it's really a matter of, um, you know, the proof is in the pudding. I think that if you're, if there's a producer on the set who's watching a monitor and sees a good two shot, they'll know it. The end. You know, it's like I don't. I mean, I, I, I mean, I do think that any time that the actors can kind of create the internal pace of the scene, as opposed to basically gathering data and letting the editor create the pace you're why wouldn't you do that mm -hmm. and uh that's you know again i think that i'm sure i've had that experience where i've had to say no i don't think we need close-ups here and i'm sure i've probably occasionally said oh shoot i wish i had had those close-ups <laughs> but mainly i feel like let the actors create the pace and and you're there to to guide that but then capture that what they've done you know, in the frame. Don't just, again, don't be a data gatherer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, well, bringing up the um, uh, producer behind the monitor, that's another really interesting chapter in your book as you talk about Video Village, which now, you know, is just we take for granted. And you, you talk a little bit about how uh, when you were first starting out, it was considered kind of a luxury and it was, you know, and, and I found your whole take, take on that interesting. Like, what do you see as the sort of, as somebody who's worked, you know, in that uh, over the course of these years where it's become a big thing? I mean, what are the pros and cons to you of the video village? I mean, what do you like about it? What do you not like about it? I'm not sure that I like anything about it. I can tell you what I, uh, I what I like to do is be near the camera and there are two main reasons to, to be near the camera. The one, the most important one is that you're right next to the cast. You're near the cast. I mean, obviously, if you're shooting a, a very complicated action scene or something with a very complicated move, yeah, of course, you're going to want to watch the monitor and make sure it's being executed properly. But if you're doing a scene with, you know, a handful of characters in a smaller space, for instance, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want to be near them so that when you call cut, and they look up, the first face they see is yours, as opposed to they look up and you know the director's 50 yards away at a monitor. And so that's what that's the most important reason. The second reason is I feel like again, this something I learned over time is that if you're standing at the camera, that's the power center of the set. If you're sitting at Video Village in front of a monitor surrounded by a number of people, including executives and producers or hangers on, or who knows who that's the that's the power center of the set and what often happens then is decisions get made there decisions often made by consensus you know group directing and why would any director want that so for me it's like if you're near the camera you're you're kind of where you should be if if there's a producer at, at video village who has a good note well let's say a note it better be good enough for them to stand up and walk their note to you in the middle of in the set so again, the, both from a creative and also from a, you know, kind of a dynamic, from a, you know, kind of dynamic point of view in terms of like how the set should operate. I think it's better to, you know, when, when, whenever possible to be near the, be near the camera. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, this, I'm sort of going all, jumping all over the place here, but I'm just looking over my, my notes from when I read the book and, uh, you know, I, I just, I love another reason I really recommend this book to anyone who's not only an aspiring director or a working director or just somebody who wants to who likes movies and TV because I think it's so fascinating, you know, getting back to you when you're talking about the people and their relationship in the frame. I love the description of how when you did the pilot for the office, you know, so much of what was important was just figuring out where people's desks were in relation to each other and how that was going to say something, you know, or, or was going to enable you mm -hmm. to convey something about those relationships to the audience. You know, one of the things, one of the pleasures of launching a show is, uh, is trying to come up with images that not only tell the story, but images that might become like signature images for the series. And, um, and on the office, one of the, you know, I, I was in charge, not in charge, but I, you know, I, one of my jobs as the pilot director was helping to figure out the layout of the Dunder Mifflin bullpen and specifically, you know, how the desks related. And, and one of the most important relationships in the story is the one between Pam and Jim. And it's clearly from the get-go, these are two people, two characters who, you know, are so attracted to each other and, and yet she's unavailable. So the, my thought was, how do I, how, what can we do to tell the story? What can we do to visually represent that tension? And so I, I, I kind of came up with the idea that Pam is always at her reception area, staring directly at Jim, but he's always turned in profile to her so that she's always looking at him, but he has to actually make a kind of effort to turn to her. And what that enabled me to do in the first few episodes was create this kind of wonderful, you know, again, signature image where you've got kind of Krasinski in the foreground, sometimes out of focus, and you've got Jenna in the deep in the background, just staring at him. And again, I felt like that, just their, the way their desks related became a kind of, you know, representation of the romantic tension between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, you know, that's something else I think you're really good at as a director is you're a great workplace director, whether it's The Office or Larry Sanders, or, you know, even he said, she said, I feel like you, your movies are always, 
you know, to, the, a lot of your best stuff is is about people in their workplaces. And like Larry Sanders is just is a great example of that. And I'm curious, what did you, you know, for the pilot for Larry Sanders, when you talk about have, coming up with like kind of a signature image, it's like, what was your signature image for that? And how did you come up with it? For the for Larry Sanders, I, I mean, one of the things I did when I was prepping the pilot is I visited the the actual you know, talk the t Tonight Show. It was this was when Johnny Carson was completing his you know you know reign as the host of the Tonight Show. So I hung out and watched how I was. I'd never been to a talk show taping before, and one of the things I did notice was that the producer Freddie Cordoba uh, was always watching a monitor, but he was nowhere near the desk set where Johnny sat. And I, it became kind of a puzzle for me to solve because I wanted to figure out a, an image where we would see Rip Torn, who plays the producer of that talk show, standing at a monitor and at the, in the same frame, you see behind him deep in the background, the desk set where Larry and the guests are seated. And also Rip can either turn to them or turn to the monitor or turn to the live audience off camera. And that actually became one of the signature images of the series. It's just the way, again, the relationship between Rip, a monitor, the desk set, and the audience. They sort of told the story of how he, as a producer, was able to monitor everything. So. Yeah, yeah. When I think of that show, I always think of Rip Torn in that position and that kind of goofy smile that he sometimes would like make off to the side, which I mean, you have a hilarious description in the book of how he came to that. Well, I, all, I, all I will say is that it, when we first started working together, I, Rip's take on this character was, ex for me, exceedingly grim, and I and I and I did some homework on the character that Rip's character was modeled after. That's Freddie Cordova, and and one of the things I found out is that he always thought of himself as Johnny Carson's biggest cheerleader, and so I wanted I gave you know I tried to give Rip a note about how he should be you know sort of more you know again more of a cheerleader. For Larry Sanders, and 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 I finally said something like, maybe you should just like be, smile a little more. And he, he and he produced this very pained smile, which was a little scary, but uh, Gary s s thought it was hilarious, and it soon became part of Rip's you know, repertoire for that for that character. Mm -hmm. so. um, let's see. Uh, are we, is it time? Or are we supposed to be heading into audience questions here? Yeah, actually, um, this is the perfect time to start our audience Q and A. So everyone, again, if you do have questions, make sure to type them up into the chat box. I will see it and read it to our speakers tonight. Please do not be shy. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and use my privilege as host to ask the first question tonight. And it's very much a bookseller question, which is, um, so this book feels very much like it's, uh, part of the new canon of filmmaking literature. So I'm curious about, for both of you, what were the books that you maybe depended on or referred back to throughout your career as you were growing your craft? Wow, you wanna take that one, Jim? Uh, sure, the first one that comes to mind for me is Sidney Lumet wrote a book called Making Movies that I think is really, really good. Uh, that, that one is really good and I, there's really not that many. I mean, there's there's only a handful. There's that's Sidney Lumet's Making Movies is a great book. There's also a book more specifically geared towards TV directing by Bethany Rooney and Mary Lou Belli called uh, The Director Tells the Story. That's good. And then the other one is there's a guy named Gil Bettman who was a sort of protege of Robert Zemeckis's and a TV director who wrote uh, he wrote a book called First Time Director that I think anybody who's starting or is about to direct their first movie or TV show. It, that's a fantastic book. And he also wrote a book called Directing the Camera about how and when to move the camera in motivated ways. That's really great. So I would say those four books and Ken's are basically the five. If you have those five books on your bookshelf, you know, that's all you need to be a director. You get those, everything else you have to learn on the job. Like those, those will tell you how to direct. I, I would say for me, the single most uh, important directing memoir that I, I've read is uh, Louis Boonwell's uh, autobiography called My Last Sigh, which is not at all a how-to book. And it's also not, strictly speaking, much of a comprehensive autobiography. He hops around from topic to topic. And I actually loved the freewheeling quality of the, of the, the way the book's organized. And, and I'll just give one 
important example of how freewheeling it is. There's an entire chapter just devoted to his favorite bars in Madrid <laughs> with, a, with a, a very great sidebar within that chapter about his preferred way of making a martini. So again, you don't, weirdly enough, I feel like I learned so much more about his personality as a director, hearing about his favorite bars than I would have had he you know, said, oh, oh yeah. And then when we shot this scene from Belle de Jour, you know, like, I, I love the, again, the kind of the, the, uh, the freedom with which he told his own story. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I'll add really quickly, not, uh, this isn't exactly a directing how-to book, but sort of following up on those lines, uh, a book that I have found very helpful, inspiring over the years is this book Peter Bogdanovich wrote called Who the Devil Made It. That's just all interviews with great directors, Howard Hawks and Hitchcock and Sam Fuller and just like a lot of the greats. And uh, he, he did that. And he also did a book on acting called Who the Hell's In It. That's interviews with like Jimmy Stewart and people like that. Those two Peter Bogdanovich interview books, I think, are really, really inspiring and, and useful. They're wonderful. Great. Um, so we've got a couple questions out. Uh, first one that I got is from Monica. She's asking, um, Ken specifically, what is your best advice for TV writers in establishing tone in a script? Well, I guess in establishing tone, I mean, I guess the, wow, that's a great question. I mean, I guess the, the, the only thing I would say is that you're going to, you're going to, you have to let the characters and the emotional content of the scene lead you i would i i would it's hard to kind of impose tone on a scene i i think that you know 10 different directors can take the same words and, and, and create 10 equally wonderful different scenes so i guess I, I that's a good question i don't have a great answer for it except that i there's a part of me that says don't worry about that your job is to make sure that what's on the page is human and relatable and, you know, and again, it, you will have different takes on it based on, you know, the different kinds of directors who might tackle it. Okay, and so our next question is from uh, two regulars from Shivali's books, Amy Willens and Nick Goldberg. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us tonight. Um, their question is, as a person who is not in the business, I've always wondered this, are you capable of seeing a movie and losing yourself in it and being swept up by it? Or do you always think about its structure, its pacing and its camera angles while you're watching it? Oh, I, I, I have to say I am to this day still able to get completely lost in a film or, to, or a television show. Now, occasionally I will say, especially if I'm directing, and I go home at the end of the day and turn on the television and there's anything on, I might just stare at the screen and go, oh my God, that operator should have panned sooner. I mean, I, there's a lot of, you know, but I would say that nothing makes me happier than to uh, get lost in a film or revisit an old film I've seen many times and still get lost in it. So that's, you know, that's the, so the answer is yes. Good, good. I wonder if, um, I'm sure that's a, a question many writers get also, if they could read a book and still get lost in it. Um, and as an avid reader and a bookseller, I would say if the book is good, yes. <laughs> um, our next question is uh, from Stephanie. She's asking, in your chapter in the book, Opening the Office, you note in the end how 200 episodes later you still had doubts about the likeness or the likability of the office. I was wondering when your perspective changed on your creative decisions behind the making of the pilot and subsequent episodes. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I wasn't, I hope I was clear, but I think the, I, what I was trying to say is that I, I'm still a little mystified by the fact that a comedy with such unconventional elements and which, with such a you know kind of offbeat uh, tone, uh, succeeded. So that I mean I, I don't know that there was a real turning point for me. I mean the, the show sort of found an audience with in fits and starts, and uh, but I will say that creatively I I feel like it found its footing almost immediately. And uh, again, I, it, that was mostly just a way of of saying I'm still a little amazed that it worked. You know? Not that I had doubts that it, but I, I, I'm still a little amazed that it caught on the way it did. That's... 
Got it. So I'm going to sneak in another question of mine while we have a lull in the questions. But of course, feel free to drop yours in the chat box. And so my second question is, this book is sort of packaged as, um, you know, about directing, but also as a memoir. And I'm curious, because the, the title kind of begs this question, which is, um, if this book were more of a how-to in bridging the professional transition from being a screenwriter into a director, um, what are sort of the core steps in making that professional move from a writer to a director or something? Well, again, I was trying to think of it in terms of not so much any particular, you know, any like a screenwriter or an editor turning into becoming a director, but more just the idea of you know what what are the what are the things that I feel are valuable in a in a, in a good director and 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 again one of them I'll just again going from the book one of them is like the ability to simply set a tone on the set that where people feel acknowledged and respected and and uh, or set or create an atmosphere where people feel they can play so I mean that that how you go from being a screenwriter to a director who can do that. I don't have a particular recipe for that, but I do feel like that is um, for me, one of the, one of the ways I measure whether I'm doing a good job as a director is, is, is not even so much like how, what, how, how the scene turns out as much as how, what the experience was like for the, for the cast and the crew on the set. Yeah. I just want to say reading Ken's book that that is maybe the single most useful thing in the book is his description of how to create an environment on set that's going to sort of facilitate everyone's best work and inspire them to sort of, uh, you know, want to give you as a director their best. And a lot of it is very simple things that you point out. I mean, one thing you say that I think is so true is just learn everyone's names. Like everyone on the crew, it's amazing how if you walk by, you know, a grip or a PA or something and you say, you know, hi, Bill, hi, Susan, you know, how are you doing? Like just little things like that. I mean, you'd be amazed. People would be amazed, I think, at how many directors don't do that. But it completely creates, it makes your job so much easier, something that simple. Well, what it also does is it makes people want to be there. Yeah. It makes people want to bring their A game. I mean, as opposed to, and I, you know, it's like, as opposed to, you don't know somebody's name, you go, hey, good morning, ma'am. You know, like, you know, like, so, I mean, it's not that terribly hard to, you know, week after week, figure out the names of people. But what it does is it changes the tenor of everything. And, and you're right, Jim. I mean, there are, I've been on sets where the director, the crew is invisible to the director. So, um, um, so that seems to definitely hit a nerve because I've got a couple follow-up questions mm -hmm. um, to this, which is one from Nicole, could you expand a little bit on setting a tone that isn't authoritarian? Like maybe some examples, like knowing people's names and saying hello. Um, and also uh, from Monica, another follow-up question is how has the tone on the set changed now that we are in an era of exclusivity? Well, let me, let me go to the first question. I mean, here's an example of, um, again, a, a way that I sort of assert authority without being authoritarian. And that is that I always plan things. I always have a, a, a plan in mind when I arrive on the set, but what I try to do is really not get, not cling to that plan. And, and, and for me, the, you know, the measure of a good scene is not that I was able to lock into a plan and execute it, the measure of a good scene for me is that I had a plan or have a plan. And then I'm also able to sort of see something wonderful right in front of my face that causes me to throw the plan away and say, oh God, you know what, look at that. Let's go in that direction. So it's a, it's a combination of, you know, just to sound like a yoga instructor for a second, it's strength and flexibility. And, um, and again, that's, that's just one, I, I think that, that that a crew or cast member will feel the difference between that and somebody who says we're doing it this way and that's it, you know? And, 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 and again, it, it's, there's nothing wrong with being controlling, I guess, in that way, but there's also a great skill to be learned where let, letting go becomes a kind of way of having a better version of control. I don't think I could explain that better. <laughs> no, I actually probably could, but I'll go on to the next question. I'm not <laughs> sure what Monica means by exclusivity. I'm not sure what that means. So 
maybe she could she could put a finer point on that i'm not quite sure what that word means sure so okay. she did send another message maybe this will help clue mm -hmm. us in a bit she also adds also are directors reluctant to relinquish that distance that's notorious for a, a tyrannical director so maybe she's talking a little bit about bridging that gap when you have a director that is tyrannical in her words right well i mean again my my encourage i i would encourage people to not think that that's the only way to be a director i mean unfortunately like when you go to film school or when you're growing up you know as a film lover there are <coughs> enshrined in film lore like many 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 stories about like tyrannical directors and to me it's like it's, it ends up being very it's very misleading well that's not the that's that's only that's not even a, that's not a good i mean i needless to say a lot of what I write about in the book is, is something that applies to anything in terms of like leadership style. So, I mean, for me, um, I'm not sure how to answer the question except to say that I, I, I am not a tyrant on the set and I do pretty good. <laughs> it's not necessary to have to lord over people. It's more exciting to get people really excited about doing their best work as opposed to, you know, sort of treating everyone like they're, you know, the, the slaves you know. <laughs> absolutely i would say that's a it's a really good point for any leader to know which is that you do not have to be a tyrant um this is switching gears just a bit this is a question from william ab he wants to talk about specifically working with actors who are extremely skilled in improv like steve carell mm -hmm. and um how do you work with them at what point do you direct but also allow the actor to thrive in their creativity um and do you have any advice for that well, uh, first of all, I mean, one of the one of the things about the work I've done with Steve Carell on The Office that many people might not know, th there actually wasn't a lot of improvisation at all. It's a very tightly scripted show. I mean, it was very well written. It was written to sound improvised. And uh, so I, I would say in that sense, I don't, I haven't had a ton of experience working with him in that way. But I guess that, again, the main thing is, as a director, if somebody's improvising, is to just keep your, you know, keep focused on the emotional content of the scene and whether that improvisation is reinforcing and strengthening that content or whether it's funny, but it's just going off in a different direction. And, and, and again, it is true that, you know, one of the beautiful things about improvisation is there will be four or five ideas that really don't land and then suddenly something does. And, and, and again, then you, you might want to double, you know, kind of start from scratch and, and use what you found in the improvisation to kind of build, you know, build that into the scene. Um, and there are people who do that so marvelously, like Christopher Guest, for example. Uh, I just have, I haven't had that much experience doing that. I really admire people, again, like Chris Guest, who do that so amazingly. Mm. So we just are reaching the end of our hour, but I want to have two more questions that were sent. Uh, the penultimate one being from a Cliff Eidelman. And this is a very nice question. He asked, after reading your fantastic book, what came to mind was how much you approach directing actors, like I do directing or conducting musicians in an orchestra. I know from having been so privileged working with you as your composer, you are very entrenched and talented in music yourself. And I was wondering if the music world had an impact on your approach to directing. Well, I do feel that I, I... I don't want to make any great claims as a musician. I play the piano, but I do feel like when I'm directing, I, I start, there is a kind of rhythm or, or, or there is a kind of musical shape to the scene that I feel when I'm directing it. And, um, and that's not to say it's either up tempo or you know, slow, but, but I do sort of sometimes imagine scenes as having a kind of musical character. Um, but again, I, I, that's just, so that's just simply because I love music and I, you know, there's a lot of music playing in my head all day, so I can't get rid of it. Um, but I do think that when I'm working with someone like Cliff or any composer, it, again, I try my best not to focus on music per se, but all, but for me as a director, it's like how I need to kind of represent the emotional needs of the scene as opposed to tell a composer how to write music. So again, mm -hmm. it always comes back to you're, you, you know, this is where your authority lies as a director, whether you're talking to a costume designer or an editor, the DP or the composer, is you're the designated storyteller. 
your authority lies and you know the emotional content of the story and the scene is where your authority lies got it and so one last question to lead us out of this evening is from sarah uh what are you both watching and or reading right now and can if possible can you share anything that you're working on coming up um I'll just mention one a project of mine that uh, is, is a passion project that I'm hoping I can get made in the next year. And I, it, it's a biopic, I mean, it is a musical biopic, meaning it's about musicians. It's a biopic about the band, The Shags. Now you may not know The Shags, so I'll give you a very short introduction to them. The Shags are uh, three sisters who, who grew up in a small town in New Hampshire in the late 1960s. And just to put it very bluntly, None of them had any musical talent whatsoever. None, zero, less than zero. But their father had a vision that they could become a great rock stars and bought them some cheap instruments and took them out of school, insisted that they be homeschooled in order that they form a band. And the father also you know, raided the family piggy bank and, and got enough money to take the three girls, his three girls to Boston where they recorded an album. And all I will say is the album is one of the single most head scratching things ever committed to vinyl ever. Please listen to it immediately. And what my hope is, is to tell that story. I, I guess I would, if I had to characterize it, I'd say it's a cautionary tale about parents who push their children to do things that they shouldn't do at all. But, but at the same time, I find the music these three girls made very personal and very emotional and but it but very odd so that's that's passion project for what are we leading into 2021 passion project for 2021 and then and then what are you watching that was the other question for both of us was what we're watching what have you been watching ken you know i i i've been i've, I've sort of been binge watching kurosawa's films Partly because I, I just, there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, there's so many that I haven't seen. And, and I, I find Kurosawa to be one of, you know, the great humanists in the cinema, but also one of like William Wyler, somebody who knows how to block for camera like nobody's business. And yet it's never flashy. But if you like break it down and look at certain scenes and like the way he organizes people in the frame, it's like mind blowing, but it never calls attention to itself. And so I'm kind of giving myself a, both a refresher course in Kurosawa and also digging into the, a lot of the films I haven't seen. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, people who are watching this who are interested in filmmaking, uh, not only watch Kurosawa, but watch the Stephen Prince commentary tracks on the Kurosawa Criterion editions, because those, they really break his visual style down really well. And it's like a, a great masterclass in filmmaking. Um, you, Sorry, what were you saying? Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, the, the question you asked me about the, the desk relationship and the bullpen of the office, there's so many things in Kurosawa where how people are arranged, how furniture are arranged, how the space is photographed, that actually reinforces the subtext of the scene. Did he, how conscious was he about this, how he did this? I don't know, but it's pretty mind-blowing so that's all that's my yeah high and low is the ultimate example of that it's, it's oh, yeah. incredible wow. but uh yeah and and my answer to the what am i watching i mean i'm always watching i'm watching movies and tv constantly it's all i do pretty much especially with the pandemic uh but just to name a couple i mean i've actually been revisiting a lot of the movies directed by john milius who i would say has a similar uh talent to kurosawa and he was obviously kind of a kurosawa disciple but i just watched the wind and the lion last night which is uh it, it absolutely incredible it's kind of milius trying to do david lean he's sort of riffing on lawrence of arabia uh but really makes it his own and is just kind of a master director of large-scale action in a way that's very clear and concise but very kinetic and exciting so uh, so yeah, I've been watching those Milius movies and those are fantastic. And I also this week, I watched The Godfather Part 3 a few times because Coppola just did this re-edit. You know, you can never leave his movies alone. So there's this new recut of Godfather 3 that Coppola put out. So I watched the original theatrical, which I've always loved in spite of some of its shortcomings. And then I watched the re-edit and kind of going back and forth between the two. And that's been a whole fun uh, thing. So yeah, Wind in the Lion and, and Godfather 3. Uh, and then I just binged Undoing on HBO, which I really love, but I'm a sucker for those kinds of 
uh, you know, I love rich people with secrets shows, so. Awesome, okay, so everyone, wherever you are right now, please give a very, very warm thank you to our speakers, Jim Hemphill and Ken Quapis. Thank you both for sharing your time and your valuable insight with us. Uh, Ken, I think you very much earned the title of nicest guy in showbiz tonight. Um, and <laughs> before we say goodbye, um, I do want to mention, if you would like to order a copy of what I, what, what I really want to do is direct, you can go to our website. I've dropped the link in the chat box. You can get a copy. We will ship it to you. We will throw it at you from six feet away, um, whatever you prefer. And before we close out the meeting, Jim or Ken, do you have any last words for us before we say goodbye? Oh, I definitely do. I am so, so thrilled to be here, or rather at Chevalier's virtually. I've been a super fan of the bookstore for ever. And so I just want to tell everyone, I don't care if you order this book, order something from Chevalier's. <laughs> this, it's the greatest store, so that's all. And I feel exactly the same way. I love Chevalier's and so I'm absolutely thrilled to have been able to do this. And I'm thrilled to be here with Ken, who's a director who I have, I admired for many years before I ever met him and then admired him even more after I met him and you know got to he talk to him and find out how articulate he is about directing. And so I had very high expectations for this book and the book exceeded them. So I'm uh, glad to be a part of getting the word out about it. Thanks, thank you. Got it. All right, everyone, thank you. Have a great rest of your Friday evening. Enjoy the weekend and as always, happy reading. Bye guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.